Hello there. This talk is about linguistic motion charts. You see the title here, more about language change and motion charts. Maybe you've seen my tutorial videos on motion charts. This video is sort of a lengthy update on what I've been doing with motion charts over the past one or two years. Right. Uh, let's start at the beginning though. How did I come across motion charts? Well, it was late at night one day and I was watching TED Talks and I came across this talk by Hans Rosling who showed fantastic statistics uh, about different countries. I brought you a thing here. Uh, so in this chart you see different countries. They are represented by bubbles and on the X and Y axis you have information about those countries. So here we have income per person on the x-axis and life expectancy on the y-axis. And you see that there's a positive correlation between the two. The higher the income, the greater the life expectancy. And the cool thing is that you can see how all of this developed over time. Yeah. So right now we're in the 1840s and the years start rolling. And you see that countries like Germany and the United States, they gain in income per person and also in life expectancy. <clears throat> and uh, as we enter the 20th century and eventually the 21st century, then you see that the, the cloud of countries really moves up so that life expectancy in India today, yeah, in the 2000s, is about 65. And that is about what Germany's life expectancy was in the 1950s interesting information and I watched this thinking well can I use this uh, with you know linguistic data I'm a linguist I like to watch language processes and language change can I exploit this for my purposes and it seems to me that the basic ingredients were all there yeah we have diachronic corpora so I could use a corpus that represents identical kinds of text across multiple periods of time I uh, would be able to select some kind of phenomenon and then create visualizations for each corpus period and then view those visualizations in sequence Rosling style yeah so um, so I set about um, doing that kind of thing and here I want to show you just the first basic example of what you can do with linguistic motion charts so what you see here in this graph are not countries, but rather verbs. Yeah, Linguistic elements are the bubbles in these charts. And on the two axes, you have frequencies for grammatical phenomena. So what you see in this graph here are English verbs that are negated, and they're negated in two different ways. Um, the y-axis shows frequencies for negation with do not. Yeah. Uh, and the x-axis shows the frequencies of negation with don't, with the contracted form. So if you draw a diagonal across the graph, uh, the verbs that are below the diagonal, they have a higher ratio of contracted negation, get and want, yeah, very colloquial uh, meat and potato kind of verbs. And the verbs above the diagonal, things like hesitate and consider, they are more posh, they are more often negated with the full form. Now the interesting bit of course is how does all of this change over time? Let me show you that. <clears throat> so you probably have an intuition of what will happen here. Right now in the 1800s there are still lots and lots of verbs that are sort of stuck on the y-axis, but as time goes on these verbs sort of break away from the x-axis and drift towards the right edge of the graph. So diachronically we have a great trend towards the contracted form. It's also very soothing to look at. Yeah, you could make this your screensaver. All right. Um, yeah, so as time goes on in the 2000s, uh, the verbs that are sort of the lowest below the diagonal, things like bother and worry, you know, don't bother, don't worry, those are collocations um, so that, that are much more frequent than do not bother or do not worry. Right, um, so what do I want to do in the next 30 minutes or so? 
I have three case studies that I would like to present to you. Um, one is about uh, compounding construction, non-participle compounds like whiskey soaked or chocolate covered. Uh, the second case study I want to talk about are uh, what I call concessive parentheticals. Um, so if I say that's an interesting if complicated solution, this if complicated is a parenthetical insert in a matrix clause. And the third case study is about a yeah, sort of anachronistic little piece of English grammar, um, the many a noun construction, many a day, many a surprise many a tear was shed, and so on and so forth. Okay, I'll finish with a few short theoretical reflections, but now let's get right into um, the first case study, noun participle compounds. Um, these are in fact a very well recognized strategy of compounding in English. Doesn't matter which reference grammar you open. Here I went to Huddleston and Pullum 2002 and they offer examples such as drug-related, homemade, safety-tested and uh, taxpayer-funded. <clears throat> and they write that uh, these compounds generally correspond to syntactic passives with a prepositional phrase. So that drug-related corresponds to related to drugs, homemade, made at home, safety tested, tested for safety, and taxpayer funded, funded by taxpayers. And you notice that it's really just the fourth example here, taxpayer funded, where you have something that corresponds to a long passive with a by phrase that expresses the agent. Yeah, so the taxpayer funds something. Uh, drugs, home, safety, they're not agents. There is something else. And this might give you the idea that, okay, non-participle compounding is a very productive process. You can stick any kind of role in the noun slot. That, however, is not the case. People have noticed that uh, there is a rather fundamental constraint on non-participle compounding, namely the first element cannot receive uh, the interpretation of direct object. So we can have things like doctor recommended, where the doctor is the subject of recommending. We can have arsenic exposed, where arsenic is sort of the prepositional object you're exposed to arsenic. But we cannot have lunch eaten, meaning, okay, somebody just had lunch. They're lunch eaten. No, that doesn't work. Mm. And this is remarkably robust. Yeah. Uh, so this is what I would like to call the no object constraint that we observe in noun participle compounding. And I hope you see that this is something of a puzzle. Yeah, You can stick almost any noun and in any role in this construction, but direct objects, they don't seem to work. Why is that? If you're a syntactician, this is the kind of thing that keeps you awake at night. You think, why is it that? Yeah, the... So people have thought about this long and hard. And um, as early as 1983, um, Rochelle Lieber came up with a theory why this would be the case. And what she argues is that, well, it's the past participle. The past participle does something to the verb, specifically to its argument structure. And uh, what she thought uh, the pa past participle would do is that it expels the direct object from its home. Yeah, so it, it throws it out. Um, and this is something that goes on not only in the compounding construction, but also in the passive. So she found a generalization that would cover uh, two phenomena with one stipulation. Right, uh, let me walk you through this theory in uh, some more detail. So what she observed was that in the passive, the object of a transitive verb is no longer part of the verb phrase. Yeah? So if you think of the act of picking strawberries and you form a passive out of that, well, the strawberries, which are the object of pick, they are no longer in the verb phrase where they really belong, but rather they are expelled and the only place that they can go to is the subject position. Yeah? So the strawberries were picked by hand. That's a good sub, um, passive clause. Now, something very similar, eerily similar, is going on in non-participle compounding, where the object of a transitive verb can no longer be part of the compound 
constituent. So if I talk about um, strawberries that were somehow hand-picked, yeah, <clears throat> I can't say strawberry picked. The strawberries have to go outside the constituent of the compound. So I have to say something like hand-picked strawberries. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Now, all of this is very interesting. What I wanted to find out was, well, how does noun participle compounding develop historically over time? And given that we have this linguistic theory saying that uh, the passive and this compounding construction, they're sort of based on the same phenomenon, um, are the respective developments that we see mutually related? Okay. Um, I used the Koha corpus, which many of you will know. It's a large uh, 400 million word corpus covering um, sequential um, sequences of time from the 1810s to 2009. Um, so we have 20 decades to compare. And uh, to give you an idea of how I looked for data, I went to the Koha and I searched for words that were tagged as adjectives that contained a hyphen and that ended in some kind of letter combination that would suggest that what we have is a past participle. So things like government, funded, weather beaten, sorrow bent. You see the endings are slightly different there. Um, all of those I got, I weeded out the false positives and that gave me a, a sizable table of some 30,000 different types. You see, God abandoned, um, tax abated, warning abetted, and so on and so forth. And in the rows we have the decades and the frequencies of these formations uh, per decade. Uh, so for instance, heaven abandoned, that happens once in the 1840s and, well, we don't know if it occurs later on again. Right, so that's the kind of data that forms the basis for uh, my investigation. And one first thing that struck me was that noun participle compounding greatly increases in token frequency over these 200 years. Yeah, so from about 100 tokens per million words to over 500 tokens per million words. So somehow this construction is becoming more and more popular as time goes on. And it's not only in token frequency that we see an increase like this, it's also in type frequency that there is a substantial increase. So the curves look actually kind of similar, they're not identical, but both in token frequency and in type frequency we see this increase suggesting that something is up with noun participle compounds, something is going on. Okay, so I wondered then, uh, how does the increase in token and type frequencies come about? What are the participles that sort of carry the increase? Yeah? The, which are the participles that gain most in uh, frequency over time? And you can imagine that in my database of non-participle compounds, there are participle families of different sizes. So there's the wetted family, which is a very small family, uh, dew-wetted, gall-wetted, snow-wetted, tear-wetted. And there are slightly larger families like the yellowed family, age-yellowed, fear-yellowed, opium-yellowed, silt, smoke, sun time, and tobacco-yellowed. Uh, and then there are mega-families like the coated families. You can coat things with almost everything. Aluminum, bearskin, beach, blood, candy, caramel, carbon, carbon cement, yeah, and we're only at sea. Uh, so there are lots of things, uh, 129 members of the coated family. Right, um, so here's a first glance at the data. Um, I have to look at my notes, sorry. Uh, so in this graph you see the, the participle families that were most successful in the early 19th century as we start out in our development. So each bubble represents a different participle family and the bubbles are positioned uh, on this graph with regard to their type frequency shown on the y-axis and with regard to their token frequency which I mapped out on the x-axis. 
<clears throat> so bubble color represents to type frequency and bubble size represents uh, token frequency. So large bubbles are the kind of participles that you would like to be likely to hear uh, very often. Now, what do we find? Among the participles with the highest type frequency in the 1810s, we have born, Alaska born, London born, uh, bred, Harvard bred, uh, bound, California bound, and then things like eyed and, and broken. Whether it's something like doe eyed really belongs to this construction is something that we can, um, that, that I'd like to bracket for the moment. So for the moment, I kept them in. Whether they really belong, that's an open question. Okay, so once I hit play, uh, we can see how this um, configuration of participle families developed over time. <clears throat> now there's some fluctuation in the 19th century and then it seems like a long time there's really nothing happening. It's just some fluctuation in the corner there. But in the second half of the 20th century, there's some growth. There are clearly things happening. And then from the 70s onwards, there is, well, I think you can see for yourself that there's something interesting happening. <clears throat> now, I'd like us to look at the same chart once more, but this time I have marked up those elements that are most successful in the 20th century. Or so I hope. Wait a second. Okay, here we are. That's the right one. Okay, so again, we're in the 1810s right now. The years start moving. And um, all right, so in the 1850s, it's colored and shaped that are in the lead, covered, you see there too. And they actually stay in the lead for the longest time. Yeah, so now we're entering the 20th century, uh, colored, shaped, filled. And um, all right, there you see the ascent of based, which uh, outdoes all others in the late 20th century. Okay, now uh, let me summarize those developments. Um, in the 1810s, we have formations like Oregon born, Harvard bred, context bound, and doe eyed that are typical. In the 1900s, colored, shaped, and covered sort of divide the field between the three of them. That They are the, the leaders. Uh, they are the most typical formations that you're likely to hear. And then in the 2000s, we have uh, participles like based, um, but also related and sized, which dominate the picture. So there's clearly some development in how this construction is used uh, at different points in time. All right. Now you'll remember that part of my research question was how do these developments compare to the passive? So I went to the Koha once more and retrieved examples of the passive and I identified overlapping participle types. Yeah. So for the funded participle, I retrieved passives with the participle funded. And I wanted to know, do the overlapping types show similar frequency developments? Now here's another motion chart that holds both the data from the passive and the data from the um, non-participle compounds. You see the um, frequencies for the compounds on the x-axis and the corresponding frequencies for the passives on the y-axis. So right now we're in the 1810s and you see that made is very frequent with the passive. It's not at all frequent with the compounding construction. Born uh, is reasonably frequent, well it's the most frequent at this point for the compounding construction and it's also relatively frequent with the passive. Okay, now what did I expect to see happening over time? Now if the two constructions are related, if the passive and the compounding construction are sort of underlyingly the same, then I reason it would be uh, expected to see that these 
verb frequencies sort of develop in a correlated fashion, like uh, income and life expectancy in the Rosling chart that I showed you earlier. Uh, if, however, the two constructions are really independent, then we might see, um, well, anything from a negative correlation or just uh, movements that are either completely vertical or completely, completely horizontal. Yeah. All right. Um, with that in mind, let me show you what happens over time. <clears throat> okay. Down there you see the uh, rise of verbs like colored and filled and shaped. <clears throat> and later, of course, you will see the increase of based. But overall, mm, it seems that this, well, it's actually a little disappointing. Not much is happening, right? Okay, there is now based. You've seen that. You've expected that. And made over time, that's probably the most interesting thing, that, that made over time decreases in frequency with the passive. Now, overall, um, to me, this doesn't suggest that there is any kind of collocational relation between the passive and the compounding construction. So, uh, to me, this rather suggests that we are dealing with constructions that change independently. Yeah. So that speakers have independent mental generalizations about these grammatical patterns, the passive and the compounding. Right. Um, what corroborates this intuition is that the participle types that stand out most in the recent history of non-participle compounding, they don't even correspond to particularly prototypical passive sentences, like the company is based in Houston. Yeah, that's a marginal passive. Does that even have an active? Yeah, let's... Um, <clears throat> Mm, Houston bases the comp no, that doesn't work. Um, the problem is related to drug abuse. The car is sized just right. Yeah, well, let's say they are marginal passives. They don't really um, match our idea of a prototypical passive. So, what I conclude then is that both constructions inherit characteristics from the past participle. That's no, beyond the question. Uh, Lieber is right in this regard. But beyond that, speakers treat the two as two separate constructions. Okay, um, I'd like to move on to the second case study here, uh, concessive parentheticals. What are concessive parentheticals? Um, before I discuss that, let me say something more general, what we've seen in the graphs that I've showed you so far are, um, well, th those were simple bivariate scatter plots. Yeah, one variable on the x-axis and one on the y-axis. Uh, so do not know versus don't know frequencies, uh, type frequencies versus token frequencies, or um, frequencies of the passive versus frequencies of compounding. And uh, that's great. Yeah, you can learn a lot from looking at charts like that, but linguistic phenomena commonly are more complex than that. So many variables are at stake, and ideally we would like to have techniques that account for these variables at the same time. And this means that we have to go from bivariate data to multivariate data, which can also be represented on a scatter plot like this, but uh, that requires an extra step in between, and I'll talk about that. Right. With that in mind, uh, here are two examples of uh, concessive parentheticals. Uh, first example, power, while important, is not everything. And the second one, it is an earnest, if unsophisticated, film. In both examples, we have um, yeah, a parenthetical, an insert, uh, that is sort of lodged inside a matrix clause. And uh, why are these concessive parentheticals? Well, because they are headed, if you like, by a concessive conjunction like while or although or though or if. Yeah. <clears throat> so this shows that, well, there's potential variation, right? Uh, so there are different conjunctions that participate in this construction type. And uh, speakers may choose either one or the other or yet another conjunction. Um, 
There is furthermore variation in concessive parentheticals in the element that follows the conjunction. So in power, while important, is not everything. It's an adjective, but it needn't be an adjective. It can be also something different, a different syntactic element, like an ing clause, for instance. Power, while appearing important, is not everything. Or you could have a nominal element, like power, while an important factor, is not everything. So also in this part of the construction, speakers can actually choose between different variants. Yeah? And you would think that within their minds, they sort of have a generalization that tells them, OK, I can choose this or this or this. Right. Um, now, a third source of variability that I want to mention uh, concerns actually a difference between these two examples. Power, while important, is not everything, and it is an earnest, if unsophisticated, film. In the first example, the power example, the parenthetical is part of the matrix clause. Yeah, uh, So it is lodged in the <clears throat> matrix clause. Power is not everything. In the second example, if unsophisticated, is sort of syntactically more deeply embedded. It's part of a noun phrase, namely an earnest film. Yeah? An earnest, if unsophisticated film, that's a noun phrase that you could pronominalize, dislodge, uh, move away, things like that. Okay, so in my analysis of concessive parentheticals, I distinguish different conjunctions, different syntactic elements, and as a third variable, different levels of embedding, whether uh, the parenthetical is embedded at the sentence level, as in the power example, or at the noun phrase or verb phrase level. So the noun phrase level, that's uh, the film example. Right. Now, what did I do in terms of data collection? I, again, went to the Koha. Um, that's my go-to corpus. Yeah, you, you figured that out by now. Um, and I got some 36,000 examples of parenthetical structures with although, though, while, and if. And I annotated them for the variables that I just presented to you. The conjunction, the syntactic category of the element that follows the conjunction, the level of embedding, and of course, the time of production in which decade these things were product, uh, produced. And that gave me yeah, um, data like uh, this representation you see here. This represents data from the 1860s. And what you see are the four different conjunctions and then the relative frequencies of different structural variants of concessive parenthetical constructions. So what you see in this graph is that all four conjunctions often appear with adjectival elements. So although small, the collection is really good, or uh, while important, power is not everything. That happens in, well, 25 to 30% of cases with all four conjunctions. But beyond that, there are differences. Yeah? So you see that while, for instance, on the right side, has this large ratio of ing clauses. That's no doubt because, well, it, it has uh, this etymology of, you know, time reference. Um, but there are concessive um, examples with while. While acknowledging their mistakes, they continue just as before. Yeah. So nothing temporal in there. Um, then you see uh, in this if bar, they, well, in, in the if bar, there are most phrase embedded examples. Yeah, uh, an interesting if complicated solution. Uh, he apologized um, politely if grudgingly, things like that. Yeah, right. The last thing that I want to mention about these bars here is that you see that some are fairly similar to one another, although and though pattern roughly alike, the colors look alike, and then while really seems the odd man out. Yeah, um, No prepositional phrases, no phrase embedded examples, and lots and lots of ink clauses. Okay, I'll come back to this. Um, but now, 
what was my question? What did I want to find out with these data? Well, I wanted to find out uh, whether there is a concessive parenthetical construction. Yeah? Given that there is so much variation in these concessive parentheticals, I wanted to know, is there a generalization that states, um, okay, I'm a construction and I consist of a conjunction, like although, though, if, and while, and you can combine that conjunction with different uh, predicative phrase structures, either an adjective, an adverb, a nominal element, a prepositional phrase, a participial clause, or an in clause. And then all of this can be embedded either at the level of a matrix clause or a matrix phrase. And that's, I hope you see that that is the most general um, abstraction that the data would warrant. And I wanted to know, is this really something that um, speakers have in their minds? Now, what would be evidence for such a broad generalization? I reason that if over time uh, the four conjunction types combine more freely with different elements that follow them, you know, the predicative elements, adjectives, prepositional phrases, adverbs, and so on, and if over time the relative frequencies uh, the, the stripes in the colored bars, if they become more hom homogeneous, yeah, more similar to one another across the four conjunctions, that would suggest that speakers see similarities between different parenthetical uh, parentheticals across the four conjunctions and form over time a, a more overarching generalization. Yeah. Um, so let's just take a hypothetical example here. Let's say that we have adverbial parentheticals that first just appear with although. John apologized, although reluctantly. But eventually we find examples with if and while. John apologized if reluctantly, or he apologized honestly while grudgingly. To me, those sound a little iffy, but you know, just for the sake of the argument, let's say first we find them with although, then we find them with if and with while. This would suggest that speakers see similarities and uh, you know, draw little analogies and eventually arrive at an overarching generalization. Okay, um, now data like this uh, that you've seen just a minute ago uh, can be analyzed and visualized in a plot-like structure yeah, that represents uh, the similarities that we can only anticipate looking at this graph and uh, represent them through spatial distances on a two-dimensional scatter plot. Okay, I used multidimensional scaling for this. If you Google multidimensional scaling, you'll find a lot of information about how this is actually done. Uh, the core idea is that we take quantitative numerical differences and try to map them as spatial distances on a two-dimensional plot. Right, so um, here you see uh, while on the right side of the graph, indeed it is the odd man out, if we look at the four of them, uh, we see though uh, in the middle of the graph and then if a little bit lower and although a little bit higher, so these three are on a climb along the y-axis. And these positions can be interpreted. Yeah? So while is uh, where it is because it has this strong preference for in clauses. It has few, if any, nominal elements, no prepositions, no NP-embedded examples. <clears throat> so that explains why it is so far off from the other three. But also the order of although, though, and if um, makes sense. Yeah? So although is a bit like though, but very different from if. And if we look back uh, to this graph here, so although and though, they are kind of similar. Though and if, yeah, they're kind of similar, but although and if, they are fairly dissimilar. Yeah, Although most in clauses, most participial clauses, but fewer adverbial examples and fewer phrase embedded examples, and all of that has its mirror image in if. Okay. Now, the interesting question, of course, is how all of this change, uh, how all of this is changing over time. And uh, that's what I'd like to show you now. So we're starting 
sometime in the 1860s and then we're going all the way through the 2000s and uh, in the first couple of decades there is some fluctuation but the most important development that happens later on you see up here that though and although somehow converge on a common schema while if and while they sort of move out to the far edges of the graph yeah so they develop their own profiles their own niches and become more different from the others okay when i saw this for the first time um i was rather disappointed because what i had hoped to see was that speakers form generalizations and, and draw analogies and um so that these four conjunctions would move closer together yeah maybe collapse in the middle uh i had a nice title for the paper that i wanted to submit i wanted to call it a construction supernova um what you see here is not a construction supernova it's a, okay a mini supernova of though and although um but overall somehow less um exciting than i had hoped uh okay nonetheless um there are some interesting things that we can observe here let me go to the next slide so my interpretation of this is that between 1860 and 2008 there is no evidence to suggest that people develop a general concessive parenthetical construction and instead what we see are processes of structural dissimulation um, so if and while moving further out within this process however although and though converge on a mutual constructional schema and that is kind of interesting after all so that means that concessive parentheticals are a construction family rather than one abstract constructional schema okay with that i'd like to come to the many and noun construction <clears throat> um, the many and noun construction as i said is sort of an anachronistic way of expressing um, a normal idea um, so many a day will pass until this construction is properly understood i've thought that many a time myself so th this construction has a mm, tendency to occur with time nouns it also has a tendency to occur with human beings like uh, many a father resisting education for a daughter or many a labor voter is not happy with the outcome mm. so there are these preferences but at the same time it's clear that the construction despite its anachronistic nature is not very heavily constrained it's not restricted to a small set of nouns but rather you can use it with any noun that you like so here is an example that i pulled off the internet during my time in australia i enjoyed many a sausage roll for brekkie yeah, many a sausage roll now clearly you can hear that there's you know this is said tongue-in-cheek this is meant to be a little funny people are using this self-consciously yeah uh, but nonetheless bottom line the construction is productive you can use it with any noun that you like um so i wondered how is it that this anachronistic construction is still so productive uh, this is remarkable mm seeing as you know in terms of text frequency this is not a very frequent construction uh, since the 1810s it has been steadily declining in frequency and normally such declines are accompanied by declines in productivity seemingly not the case here interesting so i wondered um, what happens to the semantic spectrum of many a noun over time why is it that speakers can still say things like many a sausage roll or many a linguistics professor or many an e-string on my guitar has broken over the years Pfft. odd so uh again i went to the koha you you expected that right um all examples of many and then a determiner and then a noun i retrieved and <clears throat> that gave me some 3,000 different types uh, and this time I didn't use all the data this time I just focused on uh, the 230 most frequent types 
for computational reasons. We'll see why that is in a minute. Um, and again, you see that I have the frequencies per decade and over overall that, that gave me some 15,000 tokens to work with. All right. Um, for these 230 most frequent types, I constructed a semantic vector space on the basis of synchronic corpus data. Okay, a semantic vector space, that's a computational method of analyzing semantic similarity and dissimilarity in a group of words. Uh, let me say a few words about that. So, <clears throat> you look at words in terms of their collocates. What words do we find around a given words? Uh, well, given a word such as church, what are the lexical elements that co-occur with it in a window of, say, forwards to the left and forwards to the right? And the logic behind it is um, words that are semantically related, they will occur with similar collocates. Yeah? There's a famous quote, and uh, it's always used in discussions of semantic vector spaces. This is obligatory. Um, you shall know a, co a word by the company it keeps. Yeah? So a word like church will be semantically related to maybe uh, prayer. And uh, so prayer and church should occur with similar sets of collocates. Let me uh, illustrate that a bit further. So here we have four words that we can contrast in terms of their collocates. So you see that church occurs a lot with abbey, um, with family, and a lot with Christ. That's surprising. Um, and then we have heart, eye, and sigh that have different profiles with regard to this colloc these collocates. Yeah, so heart, uh, the most frequent one is always, and then we have gave and family. Uh, sigh most often occurred with gave and with long. Yeah, so somebody gave a long sigh. That apparently is said a couple of times in this corpus. Right, so I did this for the mm, nouns that I found in the many and noun construction. And, uh, okay, <clears throat> what you do with these frequencies is that a numerical table, like the one that you've just seen, um, can be transformed into a distance matrix, which is sort of like the uh, distance table that you find in the back of a, a road atlas. Yeah, So the distances between Prague and Paris and Vienna and Stockholm. And these distances then can be visualized on a two-dimensional plot using a technique like multidimensional scale. Right. Okay. Um, so here's the semantic space of the many and noun construction and um, each bubble that you see here represents one of the nouns that occur in the many and noun construction and you see that I've marked them up in different colors. Uh, I looked at these nouns and I categorized them into different uh, groups. Um, the red group here, those are the time nouns many a time, many a day, many a morning, many a year, summer and winter. Yeah, those are there. And you see that they are actually right at the center uh, of the graph where the zero lines are crossing. <clears throat> um, another big group in the many a noun construction are person nouns like father, man, woman, mother, husband, lady, uh, and you see that the more general nouns, they actually occur here on the right side, and then as we go towards the left side, we find more specific human roles like politician or poet or merchant or knight. Then um, on the right side of the graph, we have body parts like voice, face, hand, head, cheek, breast, um, and so on and so forth. And between the body parts and the persons, there are 
a few nouns that relate to emotions or human sentiment like smile, sigh, joy, laugh, cry and groan. And then of course there are lots of garbage can categories that I didn't quite know how to categorize object, place, story. Well, we can talk about those, but the interesting ones with the largest type frequencies are human beings, time nouns, and then body parts and emotions. Now, I'd like to show you how all of this changed over time. So you see that we're starting in the year 1812, and um, <clears throat> In contrast to the previous charts that I've shown you, uh, the bubbles don't move. Yeah, that's because their semantics is um, modeled as as not changing. What we want to see is how the symmetric spectrum of this construction changes over time. Okay. Now, what you see here is that lots and lots of dots disappear over time. Yeah. So many of the types that we see early on are no longer found as we move ahead in time. Yeah, this is because the construction becomes less and less frequent um, and so many types simply do not occur in later corpus data, so they disappear from the graph. And those that do uh, persist, they become less frequent over time. Now, what I want, to, uh, what I want us to look at is how the different semantic groups develop individually. Okay, so first let us look at the time nouns. Um, they aren't that many, actually, but um, during the 19th century we see a few that um, are added to the picture, things like season, and then from the, nine, from the 20th century onwards they become less frequent, and the lesser frequent ones, they also disappear. Yeah. Um, Right, so we're left with time, day, moment, night, moon, um, season, year, and they are less frequent than they used to be earlier on. What happened to body parts? Let's look at this. So again, we have quite a few in the 19th century, and we see some frequency fluctuation, And then from the 20th century onward, they disappear. And they disappear, well, quite radically. Yeah? So, so all of them until just the immortal soul remains. Coincidence? Perhaps. But it's creepy. All right. Um, no, it's not creepy. It's because I probably miscategorized soul. It should be a human being and not a body part, many a soul that refers to many human beings. Okay, now uh, let's look at the human beings proper, not including soul, but all the rest. Here we start out with a large set, man, woman, uh, husband, and so on and so forth. And we see a few of them cropping up, veteran, maiden, uh, and then a few disappear again, but actually many remain, yeah? So the overall story that I'd like to tell about this construction is that, well, its semantic spectrum changes, but on the whole, a lot of its spectrum remains intact. And uh, those items that stay are semantically very general. Yeah, things like man and woman, um, mother, time nouns like day, time, hour. Those are very general words. And so um, my interpretation of why people can still say many a sausage roll, um, what I would suggest is that the many a noun construction does not recede into a small semantic niche, uh, but rather it remains semantically rather broad. Yeah, time nouns remain strong, human being nouns remain strong. And since words like time or man are very diffuse in their collocational behavior, um, 
And since besides them there is a really large residue of semantically diverse types, speakers don't experience the many noun construction as semantically restricted, but rather um, they think, okay, this is a construction that works with just about any noun. It would be different if the most frequent ones were very specific nouns that have a very narrow semantic spectrum. All right. Let's see. I come to my conclusions. Uh, thanks for your patience. So uh, why do I think that these motion charts are fun to work with? Well, uh, I think they can show you a bunch of useful things. Um, they give you intuitive access to information so that the temporal contours of a development are easily and intuitively assessed. You can see things that you wouldn't be able to see in large tables with numbers or um, in, in, in static graphs. Uh, for multivariate data, which is important for many linguistic phenomena, MDS maps focus on the most important dimensions and sort of gives you a squinted view of the picture, pruning away some complexity. And the, the shifting configurations that you see, they reveal changes in individual units. Think of the merger of although and though. Or they can show you changes on the systemic level. So think of the loss of body part nouns in the many and noun construction. This is something that you can see. Yeah, um, You wouldn't be able to see it in a table of numbers. Second, uh, these charts give you a holistic perspective uh, so that individual changes are shown in relation to the broader scenario in which they are embedded. And so the method encourages generalizations about groups of constructions and groups of lexical items, not just individual linguistic units. And you can use this to investigate more large-scale phenomena like changes in complementation systems or changes in grammatical domains such as modality, for instance, or changes in the ecology of groups of morphemes like nominalization morphemes, for instance. And then um, a third uh, advantage of these visualizations, I think, is that they uh, allow you to focus on different levels of abstraction. So I'm uh, professionally invested in a theory that's called construction grammar uh, and I'm interested in the question at what level of abstraction is knowledge of language stored? Do people have a common generalization for the passive and non-participle compounding? There the answer was well maybe not. Um, do they have a common generalization for all types of concessive parentheticals? Also there the answer was, well, maybe there's a common generalization for although and though, but not for all four of the conjunctions. And for the many and non construction, there it seems that, well, people do actually seem to have a generalization that is very broad, that includes lots and lots of different noun types. Okay, um, on the whole, though, the three case studies suggest that low level abstractions are really, really important and they probably constitute the bulk of what speakers know linguistically. Right, so low-level schemas rather than maximally abstract generalizations are important. If you would like to make your own motion charts, you're welcome to look at my webpage and, and uh, watch these tutorials. Um, I keep saying that I'm not a YouTube star yet, yeah, but uh, maybe you know, for my 40th birthday this would be a possibility. Um, I still have some time. But before that, let me just thank you for your attention. And if you have questions or comments, you know, either put them in the comments or, or email me. Bye.